So here we are, the service mesh, past, present, and future. I don't even remember submitting this talk. Like the talk submissions for KubeCon are so far in the past that you know everything has changed in my life. Um, but and I, I also have to kind of apologize that I've like jammed three presentations together and they all have totally different styles and like there's all sorts of weird animations. So this is just going to be a, a disaster. Um, visually, visually a disaster. Well, the audio track is going to be incredible. <laughs> okay, so let me give you 30, a 30 second kind of overview of who this person is who's, who's up here. Um, so my name is William Morgan. It's not on the slides, of course. Um, I used to work at a company called Twitter where I learned a lot of things. Those things turned into a lot of what we're building at Buoyant. And we have these two service meshes. We have two now. One is called Linkerd and one is called Conduit. And I'm going to talk about kind of the his, uh, some of the history and like the rationale and like the, you know, my personal service mesh journey, I guess, how I got here. Um, and in particular, a lot of it came out of this experience that, that, that I had and that we all had at Twitter where we moved from, you know, circa 2010 when I started there from this monolithic Ruby on Rails application into, you know, fast forward five or six years into this big massive microservice, you know, kind of cloud native, I guess you could call it cloud native environment. We didn't have Docker back then. Uh, we didn't have Kubernetes. We had Mesos, but Mesos was a grad student project, so we had to like make that thing production ready. Um, instead of Docker, we used like C groups and we were on the JVM. So we had kind of, you know, resource isolation and, and, and the packaging mechanism. Um, and then we had this other uh, kind of part of the stack called Finagle, which was this library, and the library was used for managing all service-to-service -service communication. So the way that you would build a, a service at Twitter, if you wanted to add a new microservice to the Twitter stack, you would build it using Finagle, and Finagle was this cool functional programming thing, right? We were all Scala programmers, so we were going to do like functional programming on top of RPC calls. We used Thrift for whatever reasons, and Scala, and so like we needed a cool way of doing functional programming on top of these thrift calls we were making. And that turned into Finagle, and Finagle has kind of this long history um, at Twitter, uh, where it became this, you know, over time it became this kind of very rich platform with all these features in it, and you as a service owner, you know, you, you were treating Finagle as like this nice library that you could say, hey, I'm service A and I want to talk to service B, and Finagle, go make that call and give me back the result. And under the hood, Finagle was doing all these things. It was like load balancing and, and uh, routing requests, and it was like, even the load balancing was like based on application instance latencies and like trying, you know, send traffic to the fastest thing, and it would do circuit breaking, and you know, and it, was a, it had a consistent layer of telemetry and all sorts of cool stuff. So that's kind of like the, the history of why why, you know, uh, why I'm even here, why I'm talking about any of that stuff. So I'm going to take like a philosophical second uh, for a couple slides and let's just talk about this idea of resilience, right? Because this is, this is kind of what we're trying to, trying to build in these software systems, right? We're moving on to the cloud. The cloud's scary. Cloud's weird. We don't own our hardware. It's like all different now. Right? And so we have to, but we still have to build these reliable systems. It's not okay to have scheduled maintenance anymore, right? You used to, used to be able to do that. Um, but you can't do that anymore, and you have to take into account the fact that, you know, when you're running in a cloud environment, 50% of your shit is broken at any point in time. And so you want to build software that can still, you know, still work under these conditions. Um, so there's a material science definition of resilience, you know, basically, like, you got to send, it's got to handle stuff without getting totally busted. It's a short story. Um, some people like to talk about anti-fragility, but, you know, it's, I think that's just a, a nicer kind of marketing term. Um, and so, you know, the basic idea in software is, okay, we've got these forms of stress. We're building this system, right? And, like, we've got unpredictable load from the outside world, right? People are sending requests to us, presumably, you know. And we're getting traffic from the outside world. We've got flaky hardware. We've got buggy software. I think you could add, you know, a couple more things in the, in the cloud environment. Like, I'm running on this AWS instance, and suddenly some other AWS tenant, like, gets all of the resources. Who knows why? And I get none, and, like, that's just unpredictable. Um, and then, you know, in, in response to all these sources of stress from, the inside, from, from, from inside the application, from out the outside world, we want to be resilient. And how do we do that in software? Well, you know, we can show it. We want to be able to shed load in a way that doesn't penalize the entire system. We want to be able to handle failures gracefully. And, and you know, we want to be able to provision and kind of scale and, and, and all that good stuff. Okay, and if you look at the history of software engineering, you know, back in the early days of software, um, uh, you know, internet software, I guess, um, you know, the, the way that you would build resilient systems or reliable systems is you buy the big iron, you buy two F5 things, and, you know, and you'd over-provision the heck out of everything. And this was all running, you know, in your data center, or like in the closet in the back of the office or whatever. 
And this kind of worked, right? It, it was kind of okay. It had, <laughs> had a series of problems, right? But it, it, was a, it was a way of building reliable software. And so now we advance, you know, 17 years um, to a world where that's not really, it's not really feasible to do that for, for reasons one through 100. We're now moving into, you know, the cloud, right? And so how do we do accomplish a similar thing? Well, we don't have any of the guarantees that we had in, in, from, from hardware, right? We don't have the... You know, we don't have the guarantees where this is my machine and I'm going to get 100% of its usage. And if it dies, then like, you know, Sally from the hardware department will come here and like replace it with another one. You know, we don't have any of those guarantees. So those guarantee, the guarantees that we around reliability that we lost to our hardware, we now have to replicate in software, right? <coughs> and that's the idea. That's kind of the idea of this like cloud native environment. Okay. So what's cloud native? Well, we have a foundation now, and we have a conference, and like, you know, everything is great. And kind of at the surface level, you know, in order to be cloud native, you should be using containers and you should be running an orchestrator and should be building microservices. That's a pretty prescriptive definition. I think, you know, if you, if you look, behind, you know, the, look behind the implementation details, cloud, what cloud native means and why I kind of like the term is it's software that's designed to run in these cloud environments, right? And in environments where you just don't have a lot of reliability guarantees from any of the underlying systems. It seem okay so far? Okay, so, um, you know, what's changed? We, we went and we zoomed from 2000 to 2017. Back in 2000, we were thinking about virtual machines. Oh, maybe, I don't know. Yeah, I guess so. Data centers and like this hardware redundancy. We were thinking about individual services or servers, you know, and the IP addresses, and we were monitoring these servers and whatever else. And now in this cloud native world, we've kind of abstracted a lot of that stuff away. Right? We've, we're, we're talking about services now and service discovery, service monitoring, <laughs> microservices, right? And, and we're not worrying about individual servers or individual IP addresses or any of that stuff. Right? We've, we've, we've abstracted a bunch of that stuff away. We're not worrying about individual TCP connections. Like we kind of assume that that's you know, going to work 90 whatever percent of the time. Instead, we're thinking about, well, how are our REST APIs formed and how are we going to use gRPC and are we, you know, doing flow control over the HTTP2 streaming, you know, semantics or whatever, right? So those abstractions have all changed, right? And, and the, thing, the thing that we've introduced, right, the thing that we've introduced by doing this shift, you know, especially with kind of the microservices aspect is now we've introduced this notion of runtime communication that is not just, uh, you know, not just this kind of one-off, okay, the web server talks to the app server, and the app server talks to the database, but this is actually a pervasive part of our application now. We never had this before, right? And, and when you think about it, when you think about it in your head, well, it's, it's kind of, it, it looks, looks kind of like this, right? Yeah, okay, service A talks to B, and B talks to C, and then the re re response comes back, and, you know, great, right? What could go wrong? You know, and in, in, in reality, what happens is you end up with, you don't end up with like A and B and C, you end up with a big, hairy mess like this. And this is the architecture of Twitter circa 2013. I'm gonna continue using this diagram until the day I die because it's just so good. You know, like, it's just like, who, who wants to be on call for this, right? <laughs> you know, but we were, I was, I had to wake up, you know? Um, and you can see there's this poor little service down there called GizmoDuck that, you know, was, was basically the user service that, you know, everyone talked to. And like, it's just this complicated topology of things. And so this is, this is, you know, the previous slide was like, you know, how you imagine microservices are going to be, and this is like how microservices really are. Um, and so I'll give, you, I'll give you one quick example about why, you know, just to make it super concrete about why the introduction of this very pervasive service-to-service -service communication becomes complicated, right? And this is an example that I like because it's clear this, there's like 20 other things that fall in the same category. So here I've got this system, right? The very simple Twittery system. I've got a web service that talks to this timeline service, which talks to the user service, which talks to the database. And okay, each of these things I've got like, you know, I got to account for the fact that the, you know, it might be down or it might be frozen or something. So I set a timeout and I set some number of retries and, you know, here we go, ready for action, right? Does so anyone spot a problem with this? Again, yeah, overall latency might be too high. That's right. Yep. Yep. Any other any other formulations? Your downstream service retries are useless. 
Yeah, the downstream service retries are useless. That's right. That's right. So, you know, if you look at what, what happens here, if the database starts failing, right, let's say, or let's, not failing, let's say it's hanging, because failing is easy, right? Hanging is like the thing that's really painful. Database starts hanging because it's overloaded. Well, we start hitting this retry, you know, the timeout on the user service, and the user service starts retrying stuff, okay? But now we're hitting a, a timeout on the timeline service, and the timeline starts retrying stuff. And then we're hitting a timeout on the web service, and, you know, pretty soon one tiny little you know, slow down in the database, and it's just it's a little slow, suddenly gets compounded because we're sending all these requests, right? And so this, this is a general class of like, it's really hard, it's really hard to manage this communication, and the way that we parameterize it makes a big difference, right? So we're used to kind of thinking about our, our telephone talking to the Twitter server, right? And what does it do? It like makes a thing, it makes a request, or a web browser talking to a web service. And you make a request, and you wait 500 milliseconds, and you make another one, and if you're really fancy, you do exponential back off. But that pattern really starts breaking down when you apply to scale, because this parameterization doesn't, doesn't compose, right? And this gets even worse when you get a lot more services. Every service is owned by a different team. The teams are not talking to each other, because they all hate each other, because, you know, One's written in Java and one's written in Go or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So lots, lots more examples of that, but I think that's, that's a fun one. Okay. So what's missing? Well, you know, now, now I have to do the selling bit. You know, we've got Docker. We've got Kubernetes. Like, surely at this point we're ready. We're ready for anything, right? Like, we can scale. We've got containers. Um, and what's missing really the, is, is what was missing from the Twitter story up until the point where we got Finagle. What's missing is this idea of the service mesh, some way of managing communication between these services consistently across, across the entire application. You know, and ideally, this happens in a way where you don't have to you know, get the developers to redeploy their services. Right? That was kind of the problem at Twitter. You, know, so you made a change to Finagle, Finagle had a bug, Right, and then you fixed it, great. And then it would take like six months to get everyone on to the latest version of Finagle. Meanwhile, you had found another bug, right? And so that's, that, that, that makes life difficult. Okay, so I think, you know, if you think about security, you know, being kind of this thing that you have to implement in layers, I think reliability is one of those things that you have to do in layers as well, where, you know, Docker gives you a certain amount of reliability. Kubernetes gives you a certain amount of reliability, right? Like the machine can go down and like everything gets automatically restarted and rescheduled. But there's still another layer on top of that, which is the service to service communication. Okay. So the service mesh, finally, huh, maybe I should have started with this slide. What is a service mesh? It's this dedicated software layer for managing the service communication, all right? So the idea is we want to pull it out of the applications, right, and put it into the underlying infrastructure. Uh, yeah, I apologize for these animations. So, uh, you know, quick, quick kind of, this is a very overly simplified history of software architecture, but, you know, we, we started with the LAMP stack back when we were all children, like all that we had was a LAMP stack. And, you know, you had this, you had service, you had communication, internal communication here, right? You had communication from between Apache and PHP and between PHP and MySQL, right? But those, that communication was very specific. Like these use cases were very, you know, it wasn't this general like service to service thing, right? And Apache was really, really good at balancing load over a bunch of PHP instances. And the PHP MySQL clients got very, very good at talking to MySQL, you know? So you had these specialized clients, right? And you fast forward a little bit from that into the, the world of, this is kind of where Twitter was, um, you know, into this world of fat clients. So the, the early web scale companies like Twitter and Facebook and Netflix and Google, well, you know, once they, they, they took their monolith and they broke it down into microservices, right, and now they had this consistent layer uh, or uh, pervasive layer of communication, so they had to fix it, and they used libraries, right? So Hystrix at, at Netflix and at Google is stubby and kind of the associated libraries and Finagle at Twitter. Right, and, and this, this was a better approach, right? And they all kind of had to do this because there was no way, no way of avoiding it. And the service mesh is really just taking that same logic and moving it into a separate layer. Right, that's all it is. It's not new functionality. It's not stuff that we haven't thought of before. Like, oh, we've never load balanced before. Well, we've been load balancing since, since load existed. You know, but it's, it's moving it out of, uh, the, out of the developer and into the, out of the, the hands of the service operator and into the underlying platform. So I have a little diagram of like what this actually looks like in practice. This is for Linkerd, for Conduit. I don't have a, a diagram, but it, and it looks a little different because it's sidecars rather than per host. But you know, the, what, so what does a service mesh look like in practice? Well, in practice, it's typically a bunch of proxies, right? And it's a, pro, it's a bunch of proxies that you stick in between all the services one way or another. And then there's like a control plane that gets managed here, which you know that little green line leading off to the side is is you know going off to the control plane. 
Right? And when service A wants to talk to service B, one of those instances talks through its local service mesh proxy, which talks to the destination service mesh proxy, which talks to the destination instance. So you've got two hops in there. And the reason to put two hops in there is because then you can control both sides. So you can add TLS and then terminate it, or you can like upgrade from HTTP 1 to HTTP 2, or whatever. Basically, you want to give the mesh, you know, the, the, you want to give it ownership over that communication layer. And the reason to do it as a separate proxy well, it's because then you don't have the library problem, right? Then you don't have to, you don't have to, A, like you can be polyglot, right? You don't have to like maintain the same library across N different languages. And B, especially for bigger companies, you don't have to convince the, the, the developers to redeploy their services every, every time you want to make a change. And this is all made possible. It's only made possible because we have things like Docker and Kubernetes that like make doing this sort of thing easy. You know, we could have done this at Twitter. We could have done this, you know, 15 years ago, but it was really, really hard. Right now, we have things that make it easy. So it's enabled kind of this, this, this sort of architecture. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, service mesh does a whole bunch of stuff. Reliability, visibility. Um, I'm not going to, well, maybe uh, I'll spend 30 seconds on this. So largely what I've been talking about has been the reliability semantics, like retries and timeouts, and how you might want to parameterize them differently. And like, you know, the service mesh can do some of that for you. Right? We, if it knows a request is item potent, it can retry it. Um, if it knows, uh, you know that um, you know this this application instance is returning, you know application level errors, well, we can just circuit break and kick it out of the load balancing pool. Right? We can do a bunch of that reliability stuff. It's also the visibility, and maybe visibility should have been first in the slide because that's really the thing that I think gets people hooked on Linkerd, on Conduit, on any service mesh first is the fact that you suddenly have this visibility. Into you know into into these critical like the top line service metrics. These are the things you've never had before, right? It's like success rate and request volume and service latency. Oh, you probably you probably hopefully you've had them before, but now you've got a consistent you know a consistent way of getting them across your entire application stack that's independent of what language you're written in, independent of what li what libraries are using, independent of the frameworks. You suddenly have all this visibility, and these are the top line service metrics. These are the things you want to wake up for at 3 a.m. Um, there's a bunch of cool security stuff, which I'm going to skip over. Governance, I don't even know what that means. <laughs> it's, uh, it's really expensive, whatever it is. Uh, Linkerd has some production users and has some things. Okay, I'm just kind of going to skip through this. Um, okay, the future. <laughs> All right, so I guess I, what, what I've already done is the past and the present. <laughs> um, so well, I guess we're moving into the future. Okay, so the fu what's the future of the service mesh? Um, this is this is fairly Linkerd specific, so you'll have to you'll have to forgive me. Um, you know, so I think security is a pretty interesting is a pretty interesting topic. Um, this is certainly one that comes up a whole lot for us as people are moving into these cloud native environments. You want to do things like isolation of services. You want to do things like having policy on on top of like which services can talk to which other services. Which calls are they allowed to make? You know, how do how do we know which you know who who how do we know whether a service is who it claims it is? And how do we apply policy on top of that? Um, and are we doing this like, you know, at what, what layer are we doing this? Is this per service? Is it per request? Or do we have this notion of, of customers or tenants because we're like running on this multi-tenant application? You know, and then there's the question of like, well, what about the mesh itself? How secure is that thing? Right? This thing, all your PII and all your, your HIPAA data is going through these proxies. Like, is that okay? Um, Performance, this is, you know, this is a big one, you know, because what we're asking people to do is to install these proxies everywhere, right? And to just jam them in, into every single application call. Not just once, but twice. Okay, so that means we've got to make this pretty fast. We've got to make it really lightweight, and we've got to make its behavior predictable, right? That's, that almost might be more important than any of the other things. If you're introducing a constant time cost, well, that's, that's, that's understandable. It's when you introduce something that has a high variance in the latency that like terrible things start happening, right? So we care about the P99s or the P39s or, or whatever way more than we care about the, um, you know, the, the, the P50 when we're looking at the latency distribution. Okay, and then finally, you know, and I gotta say, uh, I'm, I'm trying to make this more about the service mesh in general, not too much about Linkerd, but Linkerd has been in production at this point for about 18 months at companies around the world, and like, we just, we learned a lot of stuff about this. And a lot of the things that we, that we learned are really around this kind of operability aspect, right? So when the service mesh goes wrong, or when something is going wrong, 
How do you know? How do you know where the problem is? Is it a problem with my service? Is it a problem with the underlying network? Is it a problem with the, the service mesh? You know, like, it's just hard. It's really hard to know when there's so many moving pieces. So how understandable can you make the service mesh so that you, you have a sense, when you're relying on this thing, you have, a, you have a sense that you can rely on it, that it's understandable and it's predictable. Um, and then the other thing that's really interesting for us is, like, uh, I said here, but the def separation concerns between dev and ops. I think maybe a better way would be saying that, of saying that would be the separation of concerns between the service owner and then kind of the platform owner, right? Because they are those are two engineering groups that have fairly different goals in and fairly different requirements in kind of a larger organization. And I think a lot of the value of the service mesh is in allowing that separation, in, in, in kind of increasing the separation of concerns between those two groups. Okay, great. So that is, that's the future. Oh, wait, no, the answer. Yeah, so these are all questions. Here's the answer, right? Conduit, <laughs> conduit's the answer. Okay, end of talk, done. Um, yeah, so we, I wanted to spend just a minute on conduit because we launched this thing yesterday um, and, you know, I guess a lot of the questions in the previous section were kind of, you know, segues into Conduit because a lot of what we tried to do with Conduit is, is address exactly those concerns um, based on the, the, uh, you know, the 18 months of production experience with, with Linkerd you know, at a variety of companies around the, uh, around the globe. Some who are very, very happy with Linkerd, some who have had problems with Linkerd, and like some who have not been able to adopt it for, for a variety of reasons. Right? And so the goal with Conduit was, Conduit was not only make something that's really specific to Kubernetes, right? And like just let's just absorb those idioms and make sure it works, you know, in conjunction with kubectl and make sure, you know, it, it uses the Kubernetes like, you know, ontology and we're talking about deployments and pods and all those things, you know, which Linkerd for for, you know, for all of its um, benefits was a very abstract you know, generic layer that could talk to 20 different things, and which made it very difficult to talk to one specific, or to, 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 to configure it in terms of one specific thing. So let's, like, let's fix it to Kubernetes, right? And then let's just make it incredibly fast and incredibly lightweight. Linkerd, what was interesting about Linkerd is that, you know, all the, rely, all the, all the building blocks that we built on top of um, things like uh, Finagle, you know, which in turn was built on top of Netty, which, you know, and, and Scala, which in turn was built on top of the JVM. Like all those components are really good at scaling up, right? You give them enough memory and you give them enough CPU cores, and like Linkerd can just pro you know can process tons of traffic. It's just crazy. Like just throws tens of thousands of requests through a single instance. But in the Kubernetes world, especially if you want to deploy as a sidecar, you kind of want the opposite, right? You want something that doesn't have to handle that much traffic. Yeah, it handles a thousand requests a second or something because you're deploying it one per application instance, right? But it has to be really, really tiny. It has to be really lightweight. And you want to have a really predictable, you know, P99 latency. And that was where Linkerd had, had trouble. So the production users of Linkerd, well, it kind of depends, you know, kind of depends on what the, the size of your services. We have many people who use it in production as a sidecar. Um, because their services are big. They're running these heavyweight JVM services that take a gig of heap, and so you, you know, spend 200 megs on a Linkerd container, and you know, whatever, it's not that bad. Um, but then we have uh, folks who are writing Go microservices, and then are take the 50 megs, and then it's a little silly to, you know, to ask them to put Linkerd you know, to, to, at, as a sidecar. So we do it as a daemon set, and like, that gets you a bunch of, you know, that at least lets you amortize those resources. But it's not ideal, right? We wanted to have, we wanted to do something that, we wanted to do something that was right from the start. Um, and the other big thing that we did was uh, try and design this with security in mind, especially for our users who have PII or PCI compliance issues or HIPAA data or whatever. Like, we really want to ensure that you know, this data plane that's in there that's touching everything is um, as reliable and as secure as it possibly can be. So we built the data plane in Rust, which six months ago seemed totally crazy and risky. Right now it seems awesome because it worked. Um, and ru what Rust gives us is not only the ability to run um, native, to write native code, so you know it's about as fast as programming as, as code can be until you, you know, until you drop down to assembly. But uh, it's also guaranteed to be memory safe, right? So we avoid a whole class of buffer overflow exploits and things like that. Um, and it does not have a garbage collector, and that's important because that means that drastically reduces the the the, 
the variability of the latency. It means things are really, really predictable. And I'm not a Rust expert at all, but I know a little bit about what we've done, and it's super cool because the Rust language features allow you to very easily express these, you know, these things where, like, I want to tie all, you know, I'm, I'm allocating memory as part of processing this request, and then when the request terminates, I want to just free all that memory at once, right? And when you do things like that, you can amortize the cost of the memory allocation deallocation de over every request, and then things become very, very predictable. Um, and then all sorts of cool, powerful features. I'm actually not going to have time for a demo because I want to do a little bit of questions afterwards. Um, but we'll, we'll do one at the at the SIG or the um, the salon tomorrow. Um, but powerful features. One of the things that Oliver showed off, uh, you know, during the demo was this idea of tap, where if I have services running, you know, in production, I should be able to just kind of TCP dump into those requests. Like, just show me. You know, just show me what's going on. Um, and so we did a lot of work to make things like that powerful, uh, uh, possible. Okay, uh, gonna skip the demo, as I said. Um, and that is the end of the service mesh. That's the past, the present, and the future. And uh, I'd like to do some questions, and I'll ask that uh, you do it with a mic so we can get it on the recording. Ask me anything, anyone have a question? Is that on? Sorry. I see no button. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, I'll repeat it. Is Cogwell going to support Thrift 2 going forward? And where does this evolution leave those of us who are running Linkerd and Prod kind of figure out how to take that forward? Yeah, yeah, yeah great questions. Great. So, number one, is Conduit going to support Thrift in the future? Um, I think the answer is possibly. The answer is possibly. That's all I need to do. Yeah, yeah. We're not we're not ruling it out. I think that it, it's it's not it's not like the thrift is not like the future of, of protocols, um, but it's also a really simple protocol, so it might be easy to just do it. Um, and then you know the next question was okay what you know what about Linkerd are we throwing that, throwing that thing away and like sorry Linkerd users and the answer is no no Link, Linkerd is going to have a whole lot of use cases we'll continue to have a whole lot of use cases that Conduit won't be able to address and so you know Linkerd is here forever. If you were deploying a service mesh in Kubernetes, say a month from now, you start with yeah, if you were deploying a service mesh in Kubernetes a month from now, let's say two months from now, we got to get production ready. <laughs> uh, then yeah, I would start with Conduit. Yeah, unless, unless you had some really specific requirements around, I have existing, you know, Mesos infrastructure, I have existing Zookeeper, or I have, you know, uh, Nomad over here, and I, like, need to make this stuff all work together. Because that's the kind of stuff that Linkerd is really, really good at that Conduit is just not going to address. Yeah. You got it. Will Conduit and Linkerd speak to each other? I would like to make that happen. I'm not 100% sure. Sh I don't have a great answer for you. I'd like to. Yeah. Yes? And what about when Kubernetes is inevitably replaced by the thing after Kubernetes is too That's sacrilege. The question was, what happens when Kubernetes is replaced by whatever comes after Kubernetes that's going to be the next, the, the new hotness? Uh, well, that would, of course, never happen because Kubernetes is perfect um, in every way. But I think you know one one of the funny things about the about the whole service mesh model is that it's not actually that tightly tied to the orchestrator, right? At the tech level, you know, we integrate both Linkerd and Conduit integrate with Kubernetes as kind of a service discovery endpoint. You know, we call a couple APIs, but that integration is not really that tight. The usage, you know, the adoption is like super tight, but the the tech integration is not that tight. So I actually think that'd be fine. You know, I I don't think it would be that much work to make Linkerd work or and Conduit work with whatever the Kubernetes after next is. Same, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. Is a conduit a uh, or is it a control plane? Yeah, great question. Is it going to a Kubernetes Yeah, 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 great question. So is conduit a data plane or is it a control plane? Conduit has both. Actually, Linkerd has both too. We just did a bad job of talking about it, right? So Linkerd, you know, we all, we've all, almost always talked about this thing 
So let, let, me, let me take one step back and kind of describe this distinction. Matt Klein actually has a really good, the, the author of Envoy has a really good blog post about data plane versus control plane. The idea is that in a service mesh, there actually are these two kind of logical components, at least. You know, one is what's actually proxying the request, what's handling those bits, you know, what's, what's, what is seeing user data, what's exposed to PII and all that, and that's the data plane. And then the other component is, well, what are you using to kind of orchestrate Oh, maybe that's a bad choice of word. We're using to control all of those all of those proxies, and that's the control plane. And with Linkerd, we almost always talk about it in data plane terms, but there is a uh, a control plane called Namerd. With conduit, one of the you know big lessons that we learned is we talk very explicitly about the conduit data plane and the conduit control plane. And those are two things, or two separate code bases. The control plane is actually written in Go, right? so, which makes it easy to you know use all these Kubernetes libraries, which is nice for us. The data plane is written in Rust. And having that distinction has, has made us, uh, it's, been, it's been helpful for our own internal thinking as well. Um, because the two parts of that system have very different you know, requirements. Yeah. I think this may be on now. Excellent. All right. Oh yes, up front. I was just gonna ask how this compares to Envoy. Yeah, so how does this compare to Envoy? Um, it's a very different beast because Envoy is, I think, much more of a data plane than Conduit. So Conduit is both control plane and, and a data plane. Envoy is pretty much a data plane, right? And, and the way Envoy is used at Lyft is with a, uh, with a non-open source control plane. I'm gonna put this over here. With a non-open source control plane, the way that it's used with Istio is Istio is a control plane and Envoy is a data plane. With Conduit, we have both pieces, so it's it's not really an apples to apples comparison. I think a better comparison w would be with Istio and Envoy, right? Because that that is kind of the same thing, right? It's just, it's just, they're both service meshes. They have a control plane written in Go. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Istio and Conduit, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's a more of an apples to apples comparison, that's right. Thank you. What is the security implication by setting a proxy as a data center across the piece of it versus having a sidecar proxy just to secure that security? Yeah, great question. The question was, what's the, what are the security implications, basically of using daemon sets versus sidecars? Right, and the big implication there, and the reason why the sidecar model is so compelling, is if you want to do service, any kind of service auth or service kind of identity, right, then doing that as a daemon set doesn't make a lot of sense because you want to have a cert, you know, presumably you're doing this with TLS. Eh, there's other ways of doing it, but if you're doing this with TLS, then you'd have a cert per service. <laughs> and then in daemon set, like, you're just giving all the certs to this thing and like you've lost the entire, you know, so you've lost all your security boundaries. So that's why the sidecar model is so interesting and so compelling is because if you want to do any kind of uh, service identity and build policy on top of that, you gotta be sidecars. Yeah, really good question. All right, let's do in the back. What's, the, what's your target for production stable? Target for production stable uh, early next year. It's gonna be, in the feature set is gonna be super minimalist. That's, that's, that's the way we're slicing and dicing this is get something really small ready for production first, and then start adding features on top of that. Yeah? So the question was, uh, in the library case, if you make an update to the library, you then have to roll all your services. In the, in the sidecar case, don't you have the exact same thing, where if you have to update your sidecar, you then have to you know, redeploy your services. Um, and the answer is it's, it's not quite the same because you don't have to get developers involved. <laughs> you don't have to get the service owners involved, right? If you update the sidecar and you, you know, and I, I think Oliver basically did this during the live demo this morning, um, you, you update like the, you know, the deployment spec to include the new thing and then you roll the deployment. Right, and that's a pure like platform owner kind of operation. There's no recompilation. There's no like going through CI, CD, or unit testing or anything like that. Uh, oh gosh, when I say it like that, it sounds really scary. There's definitely integration testing that you do before before that. Uh, I'm sorry. Say that again. You have to recompile. 
you don't have to recompile when you use a, a new version of a library. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Does this work in a federated cluster? Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. I don't, I don't see why it shouldn't. I don't think the federation really affects any of this until you start doing really complicated cross-cluster traffic things. Um, let's, do, let's do just one more and then we'll let everyone go have fun. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, is Linkerd connecting with Istio? So we have a very preliminary integration that we did back when Istio was first announced to have Linkerd act as a data plane for Istio. So you could run the Istio as a control plane and Linkerd as a data plane. We didn't get a lot of interest in that. We did it and it worked. Um, you know, it, it only supported maybe 60% of the Istio uh, API at the time, but we didn't really see any adoption. No one was really interested in using it. So it's, it's possible to do, but no one wants it, you know. <laughs> All right, uh, I'll stick around for a little bit, so please feel free to come up and ask me questions. Thank you very much. <laughs>